the dinner bell, if you will. Amen. You know, what if we actually thought of it as our dinner bell? And this is a moment when we're being fed, because I'm going to tell you, when you're fed in the church, I, there's been times when we leave this place, it will be two or three o'clock in the afternoon, and we're not hungry because we've been fed. Amen. So does our pastor, you have any announcements, Pastor Brad? I know Prime Timers was last week, right? So Prime Timers is going to be next week. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I forgot. It's something I forgot to announce this morning. So the weekend, yeah, is that air on? It's, uh, it's blowing warm up here. Uh, the weekend that Bishop Kuhn is with us, Saturday morning, August the 26th, we're going to have a membership class, new members class, Amen. Saturday morning on the 26th. So now I did that. Amen. Carry on. All right. That's so good. Okay, you guys stand up. We, we have a lot of announcements that he went over this morning. But grab a bulletin before you leave. Get on the church email. She's, uh, Miss Joyce is good about sending up out updates. And if you're on social media, get on our Facebook page. Because all this stuff is listed on the Facebook page. And if all of that, you're not able to do all of that, just ask somebody here in the church. Ask somebody. We will... We will fill you in. So we have kids going back to school this week. Most of them go back to school. <laughs> Most of them go back to school Wednesday. And then for us homeschoolers, we're going to wait a couple more weeks so our kids can enjoy the pools and the, and the ponds and, all, and the playgrounds before we start school. Amen. But let's, let's just stand in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that we can come before you tonight yet again, Lord God. We, we thank you so much, Father, for what you did this morning, Father God. The lives that were forever changed, Father, because of the miracle that you performed. God, I thank you for saving souls from hell, Father, for generations because the men of God stood up. The women of God stood up and they took their place, Father. Lord, we thank you for that. Father God, I pray that you be with us tonight, Holy Spirit, that you allow your presence to just fall and rest in this place tonight, God. Lord, we pray that a portal will be open, Father God, that you just, you kiss this place tonight, Holy, Holy Spirit. You find this place to be worthy of your praise. God, we thank you and we praise you, Father. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Is it true today that when people pray, cloud the skies will break, kings and queens will shake? Yes, it's true. Remaker 
going to be a speaker of truth to all mankind. And I'm going to stand. And I'm going to run into your arms. Into your arms again. destiny and I have been set free I'm gonna take history and I am a royalty I have a destiny and I have been set free I'm gonna shake history I can hear the footsteps of Oh 
darkness he has sent me
is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever amen for yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever amen for yours is the kingdom yours is the power Just lift your hands to him and love on him. Hallelujah. Father, we bless your name. We bless the name of Jesus. Lord, we magnify your name. I thank you, Lord, for that name that is above every name. The name of Jesus, Yeshua. Hallelujah to the Lamb. At that name, every knee bows, every tongue confesses. Lord, I thank you that name is greater than cancer and diabetes and divorce and depression and discouragement. Lord, we speak that name hallelujah to the lamb of god thank you for the name lord i thank you that we're people of your name hallelujah we're jesus people (laughs) hallelujah we're christians glory to god we're being conformed to your image to look and act like you my god we bless you tonight thank you jesus for who you are 
what you've done in our lives, we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Turn around and smile real big at somebody. <clears throat> Just tell them, Jesus loves you. Amen. And I want to give our worship team uh, just a big hand. Boy, y'all worked all day today. And we're so grateful for you. And when are you heading back to college? Two more Sundays. Oh, wow. Amen. Y'all be sure and give this kid a Pente Pentecostal handshake on the way out. Amen. He doesn't even know what that is, but you old timers do. Amen. Man, I don't even know what to do after this morning. Glory to God. God is, uh, he is good. He is so faithful. Amen. So uh, I, the, the Lord has been impressing me with this, this message, this word for, for a few weeks. And uh, I really, really thought I was going to do it this morning. I'm sure glad I didn't. Amen. I, I love what God did around this house today. But, you know, it's the church has got to live and walk in truth. We must know the truth, right? We've got to live in that truth. And sometimes, uh, you know, we take our, in the church, we'll take our signals from the culture more than we take our signals from God's Word and the life of the Spirit. Amen? I mean, that's just, it's human nature, right? You know, nature abhors a vacuum. We, you know, so, you know, we don't like to be off here spinning off all by ourselves. It's... You know, since I've come into this thing 45 years ago, we, uh, you know, back, back, you know, right about the time that I got born again, you know, uh, Pentecostals were still looked at as aliens. You know, it, people were afraid to go to our churches because they thought, when are they going to break out the snakes and the poison, right? You know, <laughs> they just don't know what to think about people <clears throat> that honestly believe that God is still alive. Come on, and, and you know, myself, I, I believed in the literal physical devil that, that, was, that was living and active before I ever believed in a literal physical God. Now, I don't know why the, the, you know, the, the, the incongruity of that, that thought process never hit my mind, but I just, I just never, I never thought about God as being real. And when I saw him, amen, working in people's lives, it's just like, oh, wow. I have missed something. Come on, anybody else like me? You know, when you saw the power of the Holy Spirit at work in a church, it just blew you away. And then some people, it blew you right out. You're like, I'll never go back to one of them again. That's what I said. There's a devil in that church. I, and, uh, but it made me go to the Word of God to, to begin to understand what was happening so I could argue with these penny, Pentecostals and, uh, and get, actually get my girlfriend back out in the beer joints and the, the dance halls with me because she was going to church instead. Come on. Y'all looking at me like you're all holy. Come on, I know better. <coughs> you all wasn't saved on a church pew. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I want to talk to you tonight about the, uh, and I just, you know, the, I couldn't find a title in my, in my little brain here that was, that would just really pull out the, the impact that Pentecost had, that first Pentecost. That, uh, and so I, I said, the global importance of Pentecost, well, that's kind of a stupid sounding name. And, uh, you know, the one thing that we, we've never, and at least I've never preached it, and I've never really heard it preached, that since January when I did that series on the, uh, the Outer Limits, when I read after, you know, understanding that series that, that we preached here at the first of the year and then coming here to Acts chapter 2, I suddenly see the book of Acts in a totally, totally different frame, a d different viewpoint. That the focus is not merely on those 120 in that upper room. The focus is not, God is not only reclaiming his, his uh, dominion over men and reclaiming his creation, but he is also dealing with the principalities and the powers in the spirit world. And so, as we, as you know, um, you know, what I want you to begin to see. Let me just let me just get here. There was a seismic power shift on that first day of Pentecost, as recorded in Acts chapter two. And to, tonight, I want you to begin to see. That Pentecost is more than a spiritual experience. It's more than speaking in tongues and prophesying. 
But Pentecost is a continuation of the work that Jesus did on the cross. His resurrection, and now through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, God is reclaiming what was lost in the fall of man. By the resurrection of Christ, your spirit was dead in, that was dead in sin was reborn. Amen? Now, you know, you, you think about that. When God told Adam, if you eat of this tree, you're going to die. Well, he ate of that tree, and he still continued to live. So what happened? Was God a liar? No, he died to, spiritually. He died to God. He died to everything that God was. That's why many of us, you know, that were outside the church, we never gave God a thought, right? It, he never entered our mind. Our, our spirit man was dead. I used to have this charismatic brother witness to a friend of mine that was a junkie at lunch, and he'd preach to that guy and preach to that guy, and it never, I never heard it because I was dead, and there was no life, no spiritual life in me. Come on. Your spirit man died, amen, and when you got born again, that spirit man came back to life. Somebody say, thank God, amen. <clears throat> so your spirit that was dead in sin by the resurrection of Jesus was reborn. Adam's death gave way to resurrection power, amen. That's the good part of the story. The difficult part is you still have a mind, a will, and emotions. Come on, put on that pretty little smile. You still had some stinking thinking. Look at your neighbor say, I, he, I don't know who he's talking about now. <laughs> your, the way you thought and the way you acted, amen, even after you got born again, amen. I got, the man, when I got saved, the power of alcohol was broken in my life, and thank God that it was, but I still had, had some, some, some thought processes that were not lining up with God. Amen. That's my mind. I still had um, uh, so, some, some uh, I'm not going to call them addictions, but I still had some wills. I willed things other than what God would will for me. Okay, let's just, do you want any, do you, do you right now, do you have something in your heart that says, I want something other than what God wants for me? Now, come on, don't, don't, be, don't be goofy. You know it's the truth. You know it's right. And, and, and uh, so mind, will, and emotions. Oh, let's get down into the emotional part of your being. <laughs> your id or whatever. My wife was PhD psychology. I got all those terms up here in my brain when she was going through school. God, deliver us from evil. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but, 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 but your emotions are really where we, we begin to have issues, right? You know, because, you know, we can, we can be, you know, man, just getting all these outward things together, but inside emotionally we have, that, now these days they call them triggers. Oh, God, help us with the triggers. The only trigger I know is this one right here. I've got, I've got them at a pound and a half, and I've got them at a few ounces. It just depends on how far I'm reaching. I had to throw that in there. Triggers... Are, are nothing more but, but your old life, the emotions that are attached to a memory that when, when, when stirred up or, or prompted, they, it just jumps and comes to life again in you, and you're like, you're reliving that thing all over again. And what happens, with, because emotions are, where God made you. Look, God made you to be an emotional creature. You know, he, he made us to love. Where's, I wish my wife was in here. I'd sing her a love song right now. And she'd roll her eyes. You know, get back up there and go start preaching again, right? You know, we, we, we text songs to each other sometimes, you know, just, you know. Uh, I forget what she texted me this week. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't, you know, something bad. It was good. But anyway, <laughs> you know, we, 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 you, you go back and you, and you touch those emotions, right? And, it, and, and you just suddenly you're reliving it, right? I'm trying to think of the, the song that they sang at our, I started to say funeral. It was our wedding. Uh, <laughs> She's back there in the nursery watching. I'm joking, honey. You know that. <laughs> but still, when we hear our song, you know how that is. It just brings back the emotions, and women get all, oh. But then there are the, the negative emotions that causes us to throw up walls, and we're like, dude, we're not letting anybody over those walls. I don't want anybody to turn back on that emotion because it's painful, Right? And, and, and so when you are born again, when you are saved, you come up to an altar and, and you pray your, through, your way through to, to salvation. Man, that is God touching your spirit. 
Amen. Your spirit, man, is reborn. But this emotional side, the mind, the will, the emotions, that natural man, that soulish man is still there and he still has some issues that need the blood of Jesus to come in. Come on. You know, but you and I build walls up around those memories and those issues because we don't want to disturb them. You know, again, going back to psychology, my wife, when she said, like, we need to talk. And I'm like, why do we want to talk? He's just going to stir this stuff up. Come on, men, help me. You know, you know, <laughs> you know, I come home, I deal with problems all day long. My phone rings, it's only one ring. Somebody's got a problem somewhere in this country, they need a solution. Give me your problem, I give you a solution. I come home, my wife starts talking. I'm like, stop, give me the problem, I'll tell you how to fix it. She don't want to know how to fix it. She just wants to talk. And so when our emotional being is, 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 is threatened to be triggered or stirred up, man, we throw those, those walls up. No, 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 no. I don't want to go there. Let me tell you something. I was praying here probably about four or five years ago, going to work. I, we'd had a Sunday kind of like today, and several people you know, received the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And others, you know, they really came and they were hungry, but they just couldn't seem to release, give themselves permission to receive all that God had for them. And it, it troubled me. I, 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 all night I didn't sleep good. I tossed and turned because, folks, I want you free. I want you to experience everything God has for you. And, man, I'm complaining almost to God. I'm like, God, you know, we did everything. Man, we, the, the music was right. The lights were right. We had the violin. No, we didn't have no violins. I'm like, why couldn't they pray through? He said, Brad, it's simple. When, when a man is born again, I'm dealing with the Spirit. But when he, to get filled with the Holy Ghost, that is when I invade their soul. Mind the wheel, the emotions. And sometimes their trauma has called them to build walls. They refuse to give themselves permission. Come on, are you listening? Is, does, am I making any sense? If so, please give me some feedback here. I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to become vulnerable to the Holy Spirit. I've got to give him permission to come into my life. And that means, yes, honey, I'm sorry. You may act a fool. It's okay. We're all foolish here. I'd rather be a fool for Jesus. Amen. But, but, but you know, it, it's if you get your walls up, like when I, it took me six months to receive the baptism because I'm standing there. I had all this stuff in my mind, and I had my emotional triggers, and I'm like, you know, bless me if you can, God. And, man, I mean, the, the, the anointing, I remember it like it was yesterday. That first time I came forward, because I, I went from it's of the devil to, okay, it's not of the devil, it's of God, to, okay, it's of God, but not right now, to, okay, it's, it's, it's for me, but I don't know, and to find, okay, I want it. And that was like, like six months. <laughs> and, and so I come to an altar that first time, and, man, the church gathered around me. They were so happy because they knew I was going to do something. Glory to God. They needed a deacon is what they needed, and they wanted to get me full of the Holy Ghost. So I all came around, and they're praying for me, and, and one saying, turn loose, the other saying, let go, and, and hold on, and <laughs> spitting in my face, and amen. And I'm just, and I mean, you know, I, I, my mouth, my lips were just as tight, because I'm like, if, it, if, I, if it's, if it's going to be the Holy Ghost healed, God's going to have to take over. Can I help you, honey? <laughs> it's the Holy Ghost, but it's your tongue. It's your lips. It's your voice. And I got angry at my dad when, as a Methodist, he got filled with the Holy Ghost and in the charismatic movement. And uh, he, he called it, when, when I received the release of the Spirit, I said, that ain't in the Bible. Daddy, you got baptized in the Holy Ghost, King James. But really, it's right. <laughs> when he released himself, Amen. To give the, give the Holy Spirit permission to come into your life. Amen. And, and, and uh, you know, so he and I used to argue about that all the time because, you know, I'm a Bible man. I'm right. All right. So, so tonight, I, as, as we get into this, I want you to see that 
The fullness of the Spirit is more than just about you. God, when you give God permission, He will come in and He will begin to invade those areas of your, the strongholds of the mind, those old habits, your will, and the emotional side of you. Amen. Please do me a favor. Give God permission. Allow him to come in and invade those. He is not going to hurt you. I want to say it again. He is not going to hurt you. Let me tell you, when God, he says, behold, in Revelation, I stand at the door and knock. That's not the door of the world or the sinner. That's the door of the church. And the Holy Spirit tonight is knocking, saying, I need my church to be filled with the Holy Spirit. God needs a Holy Spirit-filled church for more than just demonstration up here on a Sunday morning like what happened today. Amen? All right. Let's get in this. Acts chapter 1-8. I want you to, uh, if you'll, you can put this up here, guys. I'm in the ESV. Um, but I want you, if you have your Bibles, please, if you've got your paper Bible, you know, get a pen out. We've got some good, uh, good sanctified Assembly of God pens you can get. And uh, Central is similar to God. And <clears throat> under... Underline some of the, there are phrases I want you to listen for that, uh, that deal with language and that deal with geography. Say it with me. Language and geography. Two things we're going to talk about tonight. Language and geography. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my what? What is a witness? It's an example it, it, uh, they've got to say something. A witness has got to say something. If you get called in a trial and you're, you, they come bring you up on the witness stand, have you, you know, swear to tell the truth, no, only the truth? Whatever, however that thing goes. I never was arrested. Well, I never went to jail. Let me say it that way. And they put, <laughs> they put you up here on the stand, right? And you sit there and keep your mouth shut. You know, that you're going to get reprimanded by the judge. Answer the question, sir, ma'am, right? A witness is someone that bears witness. They talk about what they know, not what they think. A witness is someone that talks about what they know. Come on, church. What do you know? What has he done for you? What has he done in you? Come on. I know that God, I know that my God, if you're, if you're addicted to alcohol tonight, I know my God will deliver. Why? Because I've witnessed it. I've not only seen it with my eyes, I've lived it out as experiential. I know God is able. I know that he can give you an assurance of your salvation. I know that you don't have to wander this, this earth wondering if you're saved. You know you're saved. Amen? So he said, you will receive power to be my witnesses. Where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and where? To the ends of the earth. The last words Jesus said in his physical body, Matthew 28, 19, what? Go into all the world, preach the gospel to what? Every nation, people, nations, geography. God cares about dirt. Come on. He cares about dirt. It's why he sent the Holy Spirit. We're going to get there tonight. Acts 2, verse 5. Amen. You know the story. 2, 4, they all got filled with the Holy Ghost, and they're having a Holy Ghost party. <clears throat> verse 5. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every what? From every nation. Folks, this is important. You ought to underline that in your Bible. Every nation under heaven. And at, the, and at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these that speak Galileans? And how is it then that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthenians, Medes, and the Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, Asia, Ferga, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya beyond to Cyrene. And visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, no, that's not a cuss word, and Arabians. What are they here? We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying one to another, what does this mean? Now, folks, we in the church have focused our attention in that text 
on the tongues and what God was doing. Tonight, I want to shift your focus before we focus on that. And I want you to look at the geography. God is not leaving anyone out. Come on. He is, he is, speaking, he is speaking to the nations. And I, it's a reason that song really gets me. We speak to nations. I, I, I just almost brought to tears every time we sing that song. God loves the nations. I think we raised $3,000 today to send this team to Ethiopia. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Y'all do that again when I get ready to go. <laughs> but, 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 you know, it, it's just, it's awesome, right? We're, you know, they're sending that team at the end of the year, uh, the medical team, and it's going to be amazing. But it's like, why, you know, why do you do that? There are people in this, earth, in this nation that need help, yeah? And we're helping everybody we can here, but we're not forgetting the nations. Come on. Because God is concerned with the nations. And if you're full of the Holy Spirit, your heart is for the nations. I am for the United States of America. I am for Brazoria County. But I'm also for Africa and Russia. And come on, in Australia. God called me to Australia. Amen. No, I'm kidding. Only place I've ever wanted to go is Australia. And God hadn't got me there yet, but that's all right. I'm going to other places. Praise God. So, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. <clears throat> Reading this, we cannot help but think about Genesis 11. And guys, you want to go ahead and turn there. <clears throat> Genesis 11 and the Tower of Babel experience. Pentecost seems to be a reversal of what happened at the Tower of Babel. Have you ever thought about that? I never had either. Pentecost is a reversal of what, what happened at the Tower of Babel. Well, they were there, and they said, we're going to build. Let's go ahead and read it. No, I guess that we're, we're, we're so back in chapter 10. They said, let us build a tower, right, that will reach up to the heavens. Well, let's go ahead and read this. Now, the whole earth had one language and one speech. And just, I, you might just underline that. We'll come back to that in a minute. But I want you to kind of think about this for a minute. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east. Oh, this hit me this week when I was rereading the story. And I'm like, what's, what is they're leaving the east? So that if you journey from the east, you're heading. Very, very good. You guys are good. Y'all made, made it in social studies, right? The opposite of east is west. What's in the east? Eden. The sacred space where God lived, Right? And so the further they journey from the east, the further they're getting away from God's sacred space. I, I, I think that's telling. I think that's important to note right here. Not, not developing some big theology over that, but it's just one of those little things that, that makes you go, hmm. Hmm. As they journey from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Next verse. And they said one to another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. These guys were advanced. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us build who a city? Us. Let's build for ourselves. Now, now <clears throat> when we read about this tower, I want you to, they're not building a, a, an apartment complex. This is a, what they call a ziggurat. This is a, a temple where they invoke the gods to come down to the earth, okay? This is a place for worship. And they said, let us build for us a temple. Very telling. Let us build for us a, 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 ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Next one. But... <laughs> Hallelujah. Jehovah came down. Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Next one, please. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Stop right there. You know, now, I got no Bible for this. It's just a thought that hit me. It is possible that, that but they had one language before. It is possible that the language they had when they came out of the garden was the language of the Spirit. I, I just, it's just something I've been chewing on, got, got nothing to back it up. But there was one language, and it was a language that they carried with them out of the garden. Just something to say, ah, wow. 
And then God comes down and he confuses their language and gives everybody a different language. Come on. There is something about the speaking, the language of God. The Romans 8 says that we don't know how to pray for sometimes as we should, but the Spirit knows. Amen. And when I pray in tongues, I edify myself. Jude says I build myself up. I build up my own faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. All right. They may not understand one another's speech. Go ahead. <clears throat> So the Lord scattered them abroad from, from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. I think there's one more. Is there one more? Therefore, its name is called Babel because the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all of the earth. Wow. So again, I underline they confused the language. The Lord dispersed them from there, confused their languages. And uh, so then, uh, if you remember, now... If those of you were not here during our, our study on the, uh, the unseen realm, we, I, we called it, what did I call it? I, I just said outer limits, yeah. You can go to our YouTube channel. So we have a YouTube channel. If you're taking those, Angleton Central Assembly. So go to YouTube, search Angleton Central Assembly. And then on the playlist, check out outer limits. Go to uh, study number two, the divine council. And uh, some of the stuff I'm just going to bump, it'll be explained in greater detail uh, in that in that video so man in his constant attempt uh, uh, <clears throat> constant attempt to be God and to play God it moved the hand of God to confuse the language of men and to divide the nations of the earth and to establish spiritual authorities in those nations that he delegated to members of his divine council let's let's look at that Deuteronomy 32 Deuteronomy 32 verse 7 Now you may want to write this down I'll read it with you up here so we don't get confused. Deuteronomy 32, verse 7. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, and he will show you. Your elders, and they will tell you. So what he's saying is, like, this is a story that everybody knows. Right? This is not something new. Now, for us today, it's new because we, we're so far removed from these events. But, but, <laughs> but here... Uh, Moses saying, remember, remember the days of old. All right, next verse. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam. Look at that right there. Now, sons of Adam, that is not a, a proper translation. When you read, uh, we, we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are the oldest uh, 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 manuscripts that we have, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the ESV, the New Living Translation, other translations say, when he separated the sons of God. There are, and we go through this whole, whole deal in that uh, Outer Limits uh, study number two on the Divine Council. That, that God has a, 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 a heavenly staff team. Some people call them angels. I just call them spiritual entities because they're not really angels. They're higher ranking beings. That, that, that he brings into the, the conversations uh, when he's about to do something. You remember in Job chapter 1, it says uh, one day God was meeting with his, it says, with the sons of God, came and presented themselves before him, and the Satan came also, right? How many of y'all remember reading that? So, so this is common. Uh, when, when God was going to judge Ahab, I think it was Ahab, he, uh, uh, Micah, the prophet, says, uh, you know, God was gathered with his, with his, uh, his uh, uh, divine counsel, and he said, how are we going to lead Ahab to his death? And one said this, God's, uh, he's not that he doesn't know what he's going to do. He's already determined he's going to destroy Ahab, but he's bringing the counsel in to, to, to uh, let, let them be a part of what he's doing. Isn't that what he does to you? In Isaiah 6, he says, he shows Isaiah, you know, the heart, the, the, the throne room and everything that's going on. And he says, who can we send and who's going to go for us? He knew his hand was on Isaiah. That's why he showed him the vision to begin with. But he, got, he gave Isaiah an opportunity to engage in the discussion. Come on, y'all. We don't serve a God that is a, a dictator and a tyrant up in the heavens. We serve a God that brings you and I into the discussion, and he wants to include you in some of the greatest things that he's doing on the earth. That's why he wants to fill you with his spirit. Let me not get ahead of myself. So separated the sons of God. He set the boundaries of the people according to the numbers of the, let, let, me, let me read this in the, in the uh, ESV. <clears throat> 
When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, he divided mankind. He fixed the borders of the people according to the numbers of the sons of God. So it's not the sons of Israel, the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. And again, you go to the divine council study and you'll see that. So what happened in Babel is God scattered the nations, the people to all the nations. But over each of those nations, he, he assigned an entity, a, 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 a spiritual being. To, he gave them authority to govern over those nations. Y'all still don't believe me. Do, uh, 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 Daniel chapter 10. Daniel's praying. He's had a vision. And he needs, he needs insight into this vision. And so he begins to pray. 21 days he's fasting and pray, praying. Gabriel, we believe it's Gabriel, showed up and said, Daniel, from the first day that you, you set yourself to get this wisdom, I was sent with the answer to you, but I was held, withstood, I was held up by the spirit prince of Persia. God sends Gabriel with an answer to a man's prayer, but he had a struggle getting there because somebody held him up. Trust me, honey, that is no simple human. There is a spiritual power that has been, giving govern, uh, that has been given governing authority over uh, Babylon. And that spiritual entity said, no, 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 you're not coming in here. And then I, I still would love to see how angels fight. Is it, is it you know, uh, how do they pull that off? I think it's authority and it's word. But anyway, we, I don't want to get, uh, that's a rabbit trail that I would enjoy chasing. So, so, we, so, so trust me, it's very clear. God has put spiritual entities as authorities over the nations. Do you see that part? You're going to agree with me so far. All right, all right. Uh, if you travel in the, it, do, doing missions work, you feel that. You sense that, amen? When, when I'm here in America, there's certain struggles. It, it's, it's, it's sins of the flesh, temptations of the flesh that come at us. And when we went to Russia in 92, it was a, it was a depressive thing that set over us, amen? Man, it, <laughs> when we get into Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, there is a freedom and a liberty, and devils go running and screaming when we show up. It's awesome. But then you get outside of the capital city and you get into a whole other region altogether. Woo. And it's cool. But you can feel the difference of authority in these, in these nations as you travel. And it's because God has giving, given these spiritual entities authority. And his intent was that Israel, now the church, go in and dispossess those entities but because the, the spiritual entities, just like the human instruments that he uses, are not always obedient. Look at your neighbor and say, he talk, might be talking about you. <laughs> Come on. Just like sometimes you disobey what God tells you to do, you don't obey what the voice of the Spirit says, so do these entities. And if you, if, you, know, if you, you don't have to read the book of Enoch to get this, but if you read the book of Enoch, this stuff will just blow up in your face, right? I mean, these spiritual entities are what taught humans the art of war and, and, and playing with genetics and, and all this other weird stuff. We're going we're gonna to start seeing more and more and more as we, as we progress through this year and next. We're going to hear more about, about uh, UFOs and, and, you know, the, the pyramids and, oh, now we know how the pyramids were built. Folks, let me tell you something. There, there are spiritual powers up there that you don't know anything about. But God knows... And his spirit, the spirit knows all things, and there is nothing. The devil has no antidote to a spirit-filled believer. Because when I get filled with the Holy Ghost, God plugs in into my USB drive. Amen. He attaches me to the wisdom of God, and I've got, I've got everything that God has at my disposal. Amen. Oh, hallelujah to God. All right. So he says he gave these entities uh, authority over the nations, but I like this part. But the Lord's portion was Israel. He said, this is mine. Amen? All right. Back to the notes. So, uh, so, so what we had in the Tower of Babel was man's expulsion, and man's expulsion was twofold. No, number one, man's language was confused, 
And number two, men were dispersed across the nations. And number three, authority to the nations was given to these spiritual entities, the members of the divine council. Oh, but on the day of Pentecost, somebody say, thank God for Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, God is reclaiming his authority over the nations by uniting the tongues of men. Come on, church. By uniting the tongues of men, and he is doing this by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to talk about, uh, about the language first, and then we're going to talk just a minute about the, about the nations. Let's examine what occurred at that first Pentecost. Number one, from Acts chapter 2. They were all together in one place. Amen? Division is not a characteristic of God's presence. Come on. Division is not, a, not an indicator that God's on, on site. When he comes on site, everything comes together. Amen. Come on. Uh, it, you know, if, if, if there's division in your home, you're, the answer is not to get your husband straight, ladies. Or men, I'm sorry. Let's be equal opportunity op oppressors here. If, if there's division in your home, the answer is to get Jesus there. Oh, but she's not saved. That ain't the question. Can you manifest the presence of God in your home? Come on, that's all. You know, when, God, when God shows up, division leaves. <laughs> so what's the answer? To vote Republicans in this, this, in 2024? No, the answer is to get Jesus back into the nation. Amen. Come on, church. Yeah. Come on, God is after something here tonight. It's not about politics. Politics does not have the answer to this nation. Amen. Politics does not have the answer to any of our problems. But Jesus doesn't have the answer. Jesus is the answer. Amen. We got to get Jesus back. Come on, we got to get Jesus back. We've got to get the gospel back into the street. Amen. Taking it to the street. That's, we used to do that on Sunday nights. I get the thumping and plucking the bass, and we'd sing it. Taking it to the streets. Taking the gospel to the street. Yeah, y'all should have lived that time. That was good. So let's examine the first pen. They were all together. Division is not a characteristic of God's presence. But a coming together in a unity is. Psalm 133 says that's where God commands the blessing when brothers are dwelling together in unity. Woo! Come on! So what does that mean? When, it, when I'm tempted to gossip and bite and devour and, and, uh, and, and, and talk about other people in the church, I need to reject that. I need to let the Holy Ghost take my tongue again. I like that. Can I keep preaching there for a minute? You, you, <laughs> thank God you can talk in tongues, but I'd rather you just talk sweet to your neighbor. <laughs> Come on. Just be sweet. Can you just be sweet? Can you find something positive to say? If nothing else, say, well, they, yeah, well they, yeah, their, their shoes were clean. You know, find something. You know, find something good to say. Let, let, let's just stop right here. Turn to your neighbor. No, we won't do that. That'll just mess it all up. So, so they were all together. Unity, amen. Number two, when that unity uh, occurred, a sound from heaven. See, we always talk about, oh, it was a rushing mighty wind. No, it wasn't. It was a sound. It sounded like a rushing mighty wind. I said it sounded like a rushing mighty wind. Why was that important? Well, Ezekiel 124 says the sound of the seraphim's wings were like rushing water. In, chapter, in chapters 3 and chapter 10, uh, it says that in chapter 10, it says the, ser the sound of the seraphim was like a rumbling sound. In 2 Samuel 5, 24, it, there's a marching in the tops of the trees. King James says a going forth in the tops of the mulberry trees. That's what God's presence sounded like as he went through there. Amen. In uh, 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 2 Kings 7, in Revelation 9, it says God's presence sounds like, a, like, like the rumbling of chariots. So the thing is, when God shows up, he makes a noise. Tell that to the, my Methodist and my, and, my, and my Episcopal friends. Oh, I just like, I like it to be sweet and quiet. I know you do, but you're going to hate heaven. Amen. Heaven is a noisy place, except for 30, sec 30 minutes. There's going to be 30 minutes of silence. And I'm not going to say that preacher joke. It came up. Y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. 30 minutes of silence, that's before the rapture and all the women get there. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's just a joke. That's just a joke. <laughs> Heaven is a noisy place. 
When people start worshiping, don't get mad at me, I'm just playing. When people start worshiping, amen, it says that the worship in heaven sounds like, a, like the, the sound of many waters. It's like Niagara. That's what heaven is going to be like. And how long is that worship service going to last, Pastor? I don't know. It's going to go on and on. Are you ever going to exhaust a reason to praise this God? Come on. Do I ever find a time when there shouldn't be a praise on my lips? God inhabits the praise of, of, his, of Israel, of his people. So if he inhabits our praise, then I think we're going to be praising the whole time. All right, all right, all right. Quit that. Quit that. Amen. Number three, the tongues of fire recorded in Acts 2 appeared to everyone who had presented themselves in obedience to the command of Christ in the upper room. If they were obedient to what God said. He told 500. Only 120 made it for 10 days. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm pushing some things out of my mind right now. I'm not, I'm not going there, not going there. That's my mind. That's not the Holy Ghost. But folks, listen to me. You're going to have to give God time. D don't come up here and pray at an altar for 15 seconds and think that, you know, the, uh, everything's going to change. Let me tell you something. Sometimes God waits for you to exhaust yourself of answers. And when you're done trying to come up with a, with a solution, that's when he steps in. Amen. You don't have the answer. Until you get to the place where you figure you don't have the answers, God is, God, God, God is he's hamstrung. He's like, no, keep going, baby. When you get tired, when you figure out you don't have the answer, then I'll step in. But as long as you got, you got God, yeah, God, I want you, but I've got this escape clause. No, 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 no. Amen. It's all or nothing for Jesus. Come on. I said it's all or nothing. He's either everything or he's nothing. Amen. This was a fulfillment, the tongues of fire. It says tongues of fire uh, separated. They, uh, cloven tongues. It was a, a fire came in the room. It separated, and then it set over the head of each of them. That goes back to Genesis 1, where the Spirit of God hovered over the chaos. Amen. Before creation. Amen. It is, it is a representation of God about to do something monumental. Amen. This was not a small thing. This was the biggest thing in creation, the birthday of the church. And a, 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 a seismic shift, a power, a power shift, a shift of the balance of power in the heavenly realm when the church gets filled with the Spirit of God. See, in the Old Testament, no one was ever filled. It says that the Holy Spirit would come over them, would, 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 would empower them for a moment, and then they're, 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 they're done. Amen. Aren't you glad he doesn't come just to visit you? My favorite verse in the Bible, y'all can, can read this when I'm dead. Y'all are, are come to my funeral. Amen. Some of you, some of you ain't going to make it. I'm kidding. I woke up this way. I'm sorry. I had one of the best naps I've had in years. I'm feeling good tonight. <laughs> but, <laughs> hallelujah, I done forgot where I was headed there. But anyway, pro probably was trouble. <laughs> oh, my favorite verse in the Bible, Romans chapter 8. Uh, verse 11, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of you. And folks, tonight, if you don't get anything else, I want you to get that. You were not given a spirit like the one that raised Jesus from the dead. A similar, a similar spirit. I've got a spirit like Jesus. No, you don't. You have the same spirit, Jesus. You have the spirit of Christ living in you. And, 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 Rome, and Paul says in that, in that verse that if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, that spirit will give life to your mortal body. He will begin to, not, not your natural life, but spirit life, spirit life, spirit life, life in the spirit, life in the Holy Ghost, that God's spirit will, will, will gin up, amen, will fill you with a power that is not your own. Man, today we're going down here, and, 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 and just, there's just a prophetic anointing in the house this morning. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm just going through here reading people's mail, and they're like, you know, where, 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 who told you? Nobody told me nothing. This is spirit life. Amen. This is what God expects you to do. Amen. The only reason, y'all you know, know me, I don't like to be that guy. But, you know, there's sometimes the Spirit of God says, you're going to do this this morning. Amen. Because God wants you to know this is how he wants you to operate. It's how he wants you to function. 
Amen. The, 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 the promise of the Spirit is not for pastors. It's for people. Amen. It's for you. It's for me. All right, so the, the cloven tongues is a fire recorded in Acts chapter 2 is the fulfillment of Matthew 3, 11, where John said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Everybody says fire. Yeah. Woo! Mas fuego! <laughs> Keep reading before you get all excited. I love that. I love to do that. That's, that's just setting that trap. Amen. Fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat in the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now say, mas fuego. Come on. <laughs> More fire. Fire. Coming in here to burn some stuff out of me is what it's here to do. Come on, the Holy Ghost came to, to, to reorient my personality. Come on. Everything in me that doesn't look like Jesus, the Holy Spirit is coming to deal with. Amen. He's going to, he's the winnowing fork. It, it's, you know, you take the wheat and they throw, get up on the hill. They throw the wheat up and the wind would carry the chaff away. And what was left is the kernels of wheat. Those they would gather and put in the barn. Then they'd gather up all the chaff and they'd burn it. Come on. <laughs> How many of you need to be winnowed a little bit? Let the wind of the Spirit blow some stuff off of me that doesn't need to be there. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Not just to let your jaw jiggle and, you know, who's tied my bow tie and that kind of stuff. <laughs> Come on. It, it is to... To, to carry on this process where you look and act like Jesus. That means you have to be correctable. That means you have to invite him into your triggers. You have to invite him into your stuff. You know why? Because it is the things that I don't let Jesus into that causes me to act like I'm not saved. Let me put my... My sweet pastor face on. I'm a pastor. I love you. I love you. <laughs> Should I say it again. I love you. <laughs> but you've got to be correctable, honey. The Holy Spirit is going to come brick by brick, tear the walls down of your emotional uh, walls that you've built up. You think it's protecting you. It's not. You're the only one that thinks it's sweet. I'm being serious. You've got to allow him permission to come in. Let me tell you, the baptism in the Holy Ghost is the most radical thing that will ever happen in your life. Because you get, you get the power of the Holy Spirit inside. He's not controllable. Uh, just go here. No, no, no. You're not going to tell him, just go here, not over here. It, once he gets in, he goes everywhere. He comes in and tears up. He'll open the refrigerator. He'll get out your favorite jug of milk and drink right out of the jug. Whatever it takes to trigger you, that's what he'll do. He is going to dig. He is going to prod. He is going to push not to hurt you, but to help you. I say it all the time on a Sunday morning. If, you could, if we could just lift the lid and let you see the lives of men and women in this house, it would scare most of you to death. <laughs> I'm serious. We got, we got folks that probably should have never been let out of prison. <laughs> but God loved them so much, he came in. And when they surrender to him, he makes the impossible possible and takes and flips the script. And it's like I talked to, said about my daughter, you know, plays that, uh, uh, that country song backwards, right? You know, the dog comes back, the truck comes back, the, the wife comes back. Amen. It just all goes... <laughs> It all works when you give him permission. But you've got you to tear the, the walls down. Oh, but you don't know how bad I was hurt. Yeah, I do, babe, and I'm sorry. Amen. That wasn't God. That was people. And God's not coming to hurt you. He's coming to help you. And the only way he can help you is by you letting the, letting the Holy Spirit tear that wall down. He won't do it rough. He'll be brick by brick. He'll take it apart, and he'll come in and invade. But if you don't give him permission to do that, you will, you will, you will, you'll, you'll make heaven, maybe, if you're not too mean. Some of you like me, spotted spiders. I mean, 
But, but you know, most of y'all are okay. I'm just looking here. Is there... But if you'll give him permission, he'll come in and he'll heal that brokenness. He will pour in that oil and that wine. You know, like the, the Samaritan, right? He'll come in. Everybody else has passed you by, but he won't. He'll pick you up. He'll, put, he'll take care of you. He'll love you. Come on, somebody. Thank God for what. I'm glad he didn't pass me by. I was a rebel. I was a reprobate. Oh, but this God loved me so much. But he loved me too much to leave me how he found me. He came in. He said, I'm going to change you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rewrite your, your destiny. Hey, man. Hey, come on. I, I know what my future was. I can see that boy li- you know, living out of the back end of his truck. I guess, I guess I was homeless. That hit me a few years ago when I was preaching, te- giving my testimony. I'm like, I guess you could say I was homeless. Basically lived out of my truck, mooched off my friends, you know, go, went and took a shower at their house every once in a while. I don't even remember how often. God help the boy. For real. I'm serious. And so I knew where that kid was headed. How did I wind up here? How did I wind up here? My God, church, how did you wind up where you are? It's because he loves you. He loves you. And he loves you enough to tear down the walls and to pour in the oil of the Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Wow, what a Christ. I said, what a Christ. Hallelujah. Number four, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. And when they've been filled with the Holy Spirit, they begin to speak in all of the other languages. (laughs) Do you think it's possible that before the Tower of Babel, the common tongue that men spoke was the language of the Spirit, and they carried uh, uh, the Spirit that they carried with them from the garden? When God confused the languages, maybe he did so by taking away the language of the Spirit. I I hear David saying, Amen. When Nathan confronted him with Bathsheba, I preached that last week. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Oh. Now Jesus, post-resurrection ministry, he said, I will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And the evidence of that baptism is the language of the Spirit that brings us closer to what we lost by Adam's sin in the garden. Everybody agrees with that. What we lost in Adam, we have regained in Christ. Say it again. What we've lost in Adam, we've regained in Christ. So we've got to begin to fill the earth with the language of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 4, 14, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I'll pray with my spirit. I'll pray with my mind also. I love some of my, uh, 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 my, my un-Pentecostal friends and some neo-Pentecostal friends. They'll, they'll say, you know, oh, you, you, know you, don't, you don't need to emphasize praying in the Spirit. Well, Paul right there said, I'll pray with both. I'll pray in the Spirit and I'll pray with my understanding. And he ends that 14th chapter, 1 Corinthians, saying, don't forbid speaking in tongues. Am I in a Pentecostal church or not? Come on. You need to get up in the morning, say your prayers, fine. But you need to spend some time praying in the Holy Ghost. Jude says, build up yourself, your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> in, uh, but my, I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. And don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery. And everybody said amen. amen. I ain't looking at nobody. But don't be drunk with wine or wine coolers or beer or uh, uh, Maker's Mark or just don't be drunk. But be be inebriated in the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms. Have you ever... I, I, y'all know I'm in a goofy mood tonight, so just t- tolerate me. How are you doing, John? <clears throat> I don't, he's not saying sing to each other. But he's saying let there, be a, let there be a song in your spirit. Amen? None of them go to church here, but you know, I've been to church with people in the past and anytime they open their mouth, they're just they just want to talk about what's bad and negative. And just man, 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 they're just vomiting out this stuff. 
Now, I know sometimes we got to talk about negative stuff, and I'll do that like once a year, okay? <laughs> but we should speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. So when you're going to talk to somebody, lift them. Don't push them down. Amen. Amen. When, you, when you're going to talk, sing. Worship God. That's evidence of the life that he's placed within you. Amen. Sing. Make melody in your heart to the Lord. Mm -mm -mm -mm. there you go giving thanks always and for everything to the to god the father in the name of our lord jesus christ submitting to one another out of reverence for christ all of that is contextual don't be drunk because when you're drunk you don't want to submit to the, anybody especially authorities Y'all have seen it on TV. You've never experienced it. I understand that. But I'm just saying you've watched it. You, you know, you've watched the, the Dog the Bounty Hunter, right? Try, try to go arrest somebody that's drunk, and they're just going to fight, right? Drunk men love to fight. Yeah, we'll just leave that alone. All right. <clears throat> I've already quoted Jude 120. But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. Amen. Can all pray in tongues is the question. Yes. Tongues is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the, of the Spirit. Amen. There were five occasions in Scripture where men spoke in tongues when they were filled. Three, and I just throw this in there because y'all need to know it. Three were explicit and two were implicit. The explicit, if you're taking notes, Acts 2, 4, Acts 10, and Acts 19. Acts 2, 4, we just read, they all spoke in tongues. Acts 10, at Cornelius' house, Peter's preaching. And while he's preaching, the Holy Spirit fell, and all them Gentiles began to speak in other tongues. Glory to God. Wasn't that awesome? Amen. And in Acts 19, the disciples of John, uh, Paul found them, said, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They said, We don't even know there is a Holy Spirit. So he instructed them. He laid hands and prayed. They spoke in tongues and they prophesied. So those three instances were explicit. The two implicit. Acts 8, 16 through 19. Uh, 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 Philip goes to Samaria. And he's preaching up a storm. And people are getting saved. They're being healed. And demons are running. Beautiful, but none of them had received the Holy Spirit. Philip was a wimp spiritually. No, no, it's just how God worked at that time. He's seeing all this stuff, and Simon the sorcerer gets saved and begins to hang out with Philip. He likes what he's seeing. Demons are running. Bodies are being healed. Miracles are popping. And then the disciples came from Jerusalem, Peter and some of the others. And when they came, they began to lay hands on the Bible says they laid hands on people and they were filled with the Spirit. And, and it doesn't say they spoke in tongues, but Simon saw something in what they were doing that was different from what Philip was doing. Hello? Philip, they were being saved, baptized in water, healed, and demons were being run off. But... The apostles brought something else. What do you think they brought? The fullness of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Amen. That's it. And then the, 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 the other one, so we, we can gather then that that's what happened. The other one is the, when the apostle Paul was saved. Saul from Tarsus, the Damascus Road experience. And uh, <clears throat> Ananias comes and says, Brother Saul, God sent me. Uh, you're going to be saved and filled with the Spirit. Never says he spoke in tongues. And I even listened to one of my guys on YouTube that I like to listen to. I heard him uh, a week or two ago say, you know, the apostle Paul didn't speak in tongues. I'm like, dude, you, you're a theologian. Surely you didn't miss that part. 1 Corinthians 14, Paul told that church that was a church full of tongue talkers. He said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But let's bring this thing back into order. And then he tells them, don't. Paul did, as I said, or don't forbid to speak in tongues, right? So that's the language. God wants to bring our language under, back, back under control, amen? The devil's going to fight you, but you must pray and worship in the Spirit, amen? The devil in this city needs to hear you pray. <clears throat> Again, why do I need to be filled with the Spirit? I've given a lot of uh, Scripture here. Why do I need to be filled with the Spirit? 
because there is a spiritual warfare going on in this city. There are, are demonic entities that think they are in control. They have got to be alerted and informed that, in fact, no, they are not in control of Brazoria County. We are in control of Brazoria County. The greater one is in the church today. He was here this morning. He's here tonight. And when, he le when we leave this building, he leaves with us and goes wherever we go. So we've got to open our mouth, pray in the Spirit when you're driving down the road. Amen? <clears throat> Take the spiritual territory. If you're not contending for the worship of God, then you're probably losing the battle. <clears throat> Amen. I'm not going to go there. Somebody's got to go into that city and contend for the worship of God. That's why he's going to fill you with the Holy Spirit so you can pray the mind of the Father and then step into that city and begin to contend for God's for, for the worship of God. Amen. And, and, and as I did this morning, just want to prophesy to this generation. Amen. God is raising up a generation that is going to establish true spiritual worship. Amen. The, because the Father is looking for those that will worship in spirit and in truth. And so this generation has seen it all. We've seen the, the, the Christian entertainment uh, that, that, that they call worship on the platform with the smoke and the lights and all of the, come on. But God is going to raise up a generation as we saw in Africa. They don't need no music and they don't need no lights. All they need is the power of the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of them to come out of their mouth and begin to worship God. Come on, y'all. I, I know it's possible because I've seen it. I've experienced it. The freedom and the joy as, as one group is filled with the Spirit and they're singing a song over here and jumping and dancing and we're trying to get them to be quiet so we can preach. But you couldn't shut them down for an hour and 15 minutes. They carried on like they didn't have good sense. But they were being carried along by the wind of the Spirit. Come on. Let him have his way. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the last point, but this is really probably my most important point. Redeeming the nations. Again, referencing the outer limit study on the divine council. The spiritual beings in the divine council have the same ability to be corrupted by power as human beings do. And it is not a peculiarly human thing to be corrupted by a desire or a lust for power. Even spiritual beings lust for power that they do not have as is evidenced by the fall of the accuser, the Satan. And the only thing that cannot be corrupted by power or lust for power is the one that was already in possession of the power. <laughs> All power belongs to God, therefore God has nothing to, uh, uh, nothing to, to love or to, to lust for. If he has nothing to lust after, it, it, that, that he is, it's because he is above. I'm just having a hard time reading what Siri was writing here. That he is above corruption uh, that's caused by... Uh, lusting for something that he does not have. You and I lust for things that we do not have, and we crave for things that are withheld from us. But God is not lacking anything, therefore there is no corruption in him. Amen. Amen. But not so these other spiritual beings. The spiritual beings were corrupted by the lust of power, and they took their authority over the nations that God gave them and began to corrupt the men living in them. Now at Pentecost, everywhere the apostle Paul goes, we see he is not only contending for the lives of men, but he is contending for the spiritual life of the city by challenging what they're worshiping. Come on, y'all. The church has got to begin to challenge what people are worshiping. We've got to contend for the worship of Jesus. And everywhere Paul went, he challenged what they were worshiping. And just, if you're taking notes, get ready. I'm going to run fast. In Acts 8, we just said Philip goes to, to Samaria, and then he leaves and he goes and he preaches to an Ethiopian. Glory to God. After that, it kind of gets hyped up. In the book of Acts chapter 13, the Holy Spirit begins to send the church to the ends of the earth. Paul and Barnabas begin to go to cities in the outer reaches of their world. And when they do, they encounter resistance from people, which is evidence of resistance from re regional or territorial spirits. You see, when people resist you, it's, sometimes it's not them. Sometimes it's not them. They are under the domain of a, of a territorial ruler. And you've got to understand it, not get offended, not get intimidated, but continue to preach. Amen. 
In Acts 13, 8, listen to this. Elimaeus, the, the magician, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making the crooked... The, make crooked the straight paths of the Lord. Now, friends, he's not talking to that human. He's talking to the spirit behind that human. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. That's Acts 13, verse 8 through 11. In Antioch, Amen. Acts 13, verse 50. But the Jews incited devout women of, of high standing, and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. So what happened in Antioch, they saw the apostles coming and they drove them out of the geographical region because the territorial entity didn't want to give up the authority that he had. Because, friend, listen to me. When you and I come on the scene, we are the gatekeepers. We are the authority. We don't ask for permission from the, from, from the territorial rulers. We come in to exercise them, to cast them out. Read, read Colossians and Ephesians and Galatians, and Paul will tell you, you are the top of the spiritual food chain. And by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we exercise that authority. Come on, y'all. In Lystra, Acts 14, verse 11, when the crowd saw that Paul, what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Laconian, the gods, little g, have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. Now, if that happened today, amen, 99% of preachers would say, go ahead, I am a sacrifice to me. Come on. That's what we're after. We want to get authority over men. But the heart of Jesus is not that. We're here to establish the king and his kingdom. Amen? So instead, but when the apostles, and when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments in mourning, and they rushed into the crowd crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We're men just like you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Listen to what he said. In the past, is this up here? Yeah. In bygone generations, listen to this. In past generations, God allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Come on. I, I'm almost done. Don't, don't check out on me here. Stay with me. In the past, God allowed generations to walk in their own ways, whatever they thought, whatever these spiritual beings would convince the people to do. But Jews, uh, uh, amen, I'm sorry, that, that's, a, that's a new thought. Amen. In the past, God allowed them to walk in these ways. But folks, it's, God doesn't allow that anymore. He doesn't allow that anymore. Why? Because he said there's only one way. Now, you and I are supposed to be going into regions and breaking down the, the territorial spirits and, and erecting the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. That's going to take more than an argument. It's going to take more than a seminary degree. That's going to take the power of the Holy Spirit living and active and working in your life and in my life. Come on. It's more than tongues, but it is tongues. Tongues is the evidence, but God wants more than that. Come on. Wake your neighbor up. We, we ain't done yet. Uh, he, give me that 17th verse. I thought there might be. Nevertheless, he did not leave. That's it. I just didn't copy it here. He did not leave himself without a witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with good food and gladness. And he goes on. That was in Lystra. In Philippi, y'all know that story, a slave girl who had a spirit of div divination. Everybody wants to fall. What kind of spirit was that? The python spirit. Get over yourself. Come on. I don't care what spirit it is. It, it bows its knee to the name of Jesus. 
you can give it whatever name you want to give it. I'm not, uh, you know, I, I, I've heard, you know, people want to, they want to come interview demon-possessed people. This happened years ago. We had some friends lived across the street from us, and they were, they were of another denomination that didn't really believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but the pastor wanted to cast out devils. And he'd bring what he thought were demon-possessed people up here and interview them. We're, we're not supposed to interview them. We're supposed to cast them out. But when, when I was in, in Africa, that, that church uh, that we went to the West, amen, I'm preaching and demon-possessed people are just falling out just from the power of the Word of God. And the pastor went running to them with a microphone so, and, and so that we could hear the, them screaming as the demons left them. And I turned to, to my trance and I said, why in the world is he doing that? Well, he wants the people to see the, the power of God at work. I'm like, but, but that's giving a microphone to the devil. The power of God comes from the Word. Come on, don't give a microphone to a devil. Give the microphone to the Word of God and let the devil run. My Lord Jesus, hallelujah. Amen. So the slave girl, Paul, after a few days, got tired of it, said, get out. That was in Philippi. He is dispossessing. Uh, that, that whole thing, when you do a study, and I did it, Pastor G was teaching a Sunday school class years ago. Uh, uh, on Colossians, I think it was, and I, I filled in for him one Sunday, and, and, and we were, uh, Ephesians, somebody said that? Yeah, anyway, I, I, my hearing aids don't work when I'm talking up here. I got new hearing aids, y'all didn't see that, hallelujah. But, uh, but, but, but we, we were looking at that, and it was, it was an oracle, De the oracle of Delphi, it's the whole, the whole thing, right? And, and when the apostle Paul dealt with that, he wasn't dealing with that girl, he was dealing with that spiritual entity in that city. It's a beautiful, beautiful study when you get there. Amen. What I'm trying to help you to see is when God fills you with the Holy Spirit, it's to give you more than a tongue. It's to give you authority over the nations. To give you authority over the nations. To give you authority over the nations. The territorial spirits. There is you come behind in no good thing, y'all. Thessalonica, uh, uh, they, they said of them, they said, uh, when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men have turned the world upside down, the world upside down. Amen. The nations. Come on. It's all about uh, spiritual geography. Amen. In, in Acts 17, he went to Athens, and he said, you know, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, I'm going to preach to you. Amen. In Ephesus. Amen. That's uh, Acts 19, 23. I'm going to skip down. And there's danger not only, oh, oh, yes, so the, the silversmith was all upset. There's danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. Can you imagine all of Asia and the world is worshiping this goddess, and one little short man probably got a got, got, uh, 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 eyesight issues comes hobbling into the city amen he's got a history of being stoned and left for dead he's got a history of of, of being uh g going without he's probably skinny as a rail because he he misses a lot of meals because he's preaching the gospel and this little old man paul comes hobbling in and they're terrified of him because uh, the whole world is gonna miss out i want you to see friend the devil is terrified of you. You might be 90 or 19. Amen. But if you understand who you are and you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, there is nothing that hell can do to resist you. I mean, the Apostle Paul, his own words, he said, I know I don't look like much on the outside. That's a Dubos translation, but it's in there. He said, I know I don't look like much, but my words carry power. God, let the church of 2023 understand who we are. It's why I was so grieved in my spirit. And I had the words form, amen, when they shut the church down for, for that thing. I'm sorry, I don't want to lose my YouTube audience. For that thing, they, they told us, churches are going to shut down. And we did for four weeks. And then, and then but I, I wept almost the whole time. We come up here, uh, there's about four or five of us come up here, and we recorded a few services. And I'm like, this ain't working. Because... 
the, the, uh, the culture was shifting and the church was muzzled. Our, your voice matters. Don't you allow the enemy to silence your voice. Don't preach the name of Jesus anymore, they told that early church. said, so you do what you got to do, <laughs> but we, we're going to obey. Whether you think it's better to obey God or man, but we're going to obey God. And I took that during that thing, and so we started having outdoor services, and then it started warming up. Mother's Day, I'm sorry, we're coming back inside. We are going to start the church. We are going to obey God, and we're going to let God take care of us. Amen? Amen. Come on, church. You've got, where's your faith? Oh, I, you've, at, the church has faith as long as everything's going good. But the first time the devil raises his head, we want to run in fear. Let me tell you something. Oh, to God that I live, I was preaching in Canada. I'd be in the next cell with that old boy that's in prison right now. They're putting preachers in prison for preaching the gospel, for having churches, for telling girls they can't be boys and boys, they can't be girls. God help us. You are going to have to get out there and speak. Some of you may go to jail. Some of you may go to prison. Some of you may lose your life. But let me lose my life challenging the principalities and the powers. Amen. The rulers of the spiritual. I'm not, they're not going to have the land where I live. Amen. All right. I'm going to end right here. Two more verses. Your position in Christ. Ephesians 1, 19. If you will put that up there. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far, who, who's there? Christ. Far above what? All rule, authority, power, and dominion. And above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And has put all things under his feet. Everything is under Jesus' feet. Do you believe that? I said, do you believe that? The Christ that you serve is the top of the spiritual food chain. Come on. Everything else is under his feet. And gave him as head over all things to the church. Amen. He's over the church. And where's the church? We're his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. If he is over everything and we are his body, what are we over? Everything but him. Okay, let me give you a little anatomy class. Here is my head. Here is my body, such as it is. Amen. My head is above everything. My body is above everything except my head. Everything else is under my feet. These are my feet. Everything else, every principality, every power is under the feet of Jesus. Where am I in relation? I am the body. I have feet. Everything else is under my feet. Church, everything is under your feet. God help us to get all right, in case you missed that one, Colossians 3, 1 through 3. If, you then, if, you the, if then you have been raised with Christ, anybody been raised with Jesus? Resurrection power living in you. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above and not on things of the earth. Look at this verse. Underline this in your Bible. For you have died... Oh, God, I've died. Yeah, I died to my old man. I died to my old ways. I've got a new life. Anybody in here got a new life? And your life, the life that you, how could, what do you mean I have a life, but you just said I died? My spiritual life. I've been, I've died, and my life is hidden with Christ in God. Where is your appointed dwelling place in the spiritual hierarchy? In Christ. With everything else under your feet. Everything. And it's why God says, why the Apostle Paul, every time he met a believer, have you received the Spirit since you believed? 
Why? Because it is imperative for this, 20, this church in 2023 to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be men and women who know to how to walk in the Spirit, how to pray in the Spirit, how to flow in the river of the Spirit. It is imperative that we understand we are people of the Spirit. Because that's when we're, I'm preaching and I thank God for people that were saved this morning. I thank God for people that were, well, had received words of prophecy and, and, and they were encouraged, edified, exhorted, and comforted. I thank God for that. But more than that, by, the, by releasing the river of the Spirit from my life and from the life of this church, this region is being sanctified by the Spirit of God. Hell is being deposed. Come on, do you hear what I'm preaching? Hell is losing the battle as we move with and in the Holy Ghost. Come on. It's why we are here. Let me tell you something, you can build a lot bigger church if you don't do some of this stuff. It's true. It's true. You go back and you count the numbers. The Apostle Paul, he didn't run no mega church because he knew that wasn't what was needed. Jesus didn't you know, he didn't pay no attention to the 5,000 loaves and fishes crowd. They're going to they're leave as soon as that McDonald's is built down the road. Because that's all they're there for is the loaves and the fishes. He found 12. Just give me 12 men and women who are full of God, who want nothing but God. They'll turn this world upside down. Come on. Give me a church of this size right here. Amen. I, 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 I was talking to Anthony and Amy. I love I loved preaching when, uh, at the big church in Ethiopia. We preached to a couple of thousand people. It's pretty cool. We go to that other church, preach to 800 people. That was awesome because they were on fire. And like I say, demons were falling out and healings were popping. And God, the power of God was moving. That was wonderful. But I would rather preach to those hundred men and women gathered to plant churches. <laughs> I'd rather pour into that small group because I know I will change Africa by pouring the life of the Spirit inside of that hundred rather than preaching to 2,000. Come on, are you hearing what I'm saying? I, I, I love numbers. I ain't against numbers, but I am about the men and women of God getting full of the Holy Spirit and being the devil's greatest nightmare when you leave this house tonight. Amen. Stand to your feet. Let's give God praise. I want to I wanna spend some time in these altars tonight. Amen. Come on. Now if you, uh, Bishop Kuhn is going to be with us in a few weeks. And on Friday night, that's going to be a wild night. We're going to be just flowing and demonstrating. On Saturday and Sunday, we're going to be talking about the, uh, the spirit of mammon. Amen. It's going to be wonderful. Going to have a, that Saturday morning, we're going to have a, a, a membership class. Hallelujah. All good. Let me tell you something. What is the most important thing we can do here tonight is to, is to allow the Holy Spirit to empower us for this next week. Amen? Amen. Y'all just want to put some, uh, some music on, if you will. Y'all just, just kind of hang out. Amen. Let's just come on up to the front while they do. Let's come spend some time in prayer. Talk to God. Amen. I want you to be filled <laughs> with, with the Holy Spirit for the power from on high. To come into your life. God is equipping and empowering you. Amen. To do the works of the ministry. Hallelujah to God. Let's spend time talking to God. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah.